morning. Today is Friday, August 7th, 2020. Uh, I am Mary Robinson, director of the McCracken Research Library, and I'm joined here in the library reading room with my colleagues to discuss um, a book which they co-edited. The book is Beckoning Frontiers, the memoir of a Wyoming entrepreneur. It's the memoir of George Beck, who is known to us mostly as a co-founder of Cody, Wyoming. And this morning we're going to talk with our editors about that and about the book, which they've been working on for quite a while and which was released earlier this year by the University of Nebraska Press. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, with me are Jeremy Johnston and Lynn Howes, and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves to, to everyone. Um, I'm Lynn Howes, and I worked here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West for 13 years, and I'm now the volunteer curator director of a new local history museum called the Cody Heritage Museum. And I am Jeremy Johnston, the historian here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, and the Tate Endowed Chair of Western History. So you guys took on this, this task of editing a manuscript, and I'd like for you to begin by explaining how you came upon that project and why you thought it was important to put this book together. This project really began through the papers of William F. Cody, and the project is geared towards collecting the writings of Buffalo Bill Cody, making those available online and through print. And Lynn and I, long discussed the need to publish Beck's memoir and make that readily available because it did offer this unique perspective of the founding of the town of Cody, Wyoming. But when we took on the project, we quickly discovered that the two known manuscripts, one of which was held by the American Heritage Center at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, Wyoming, and then the other held by the Park County archives here in Cody, Wyoming, we noted that they were very different. So the one here at the Park County Archives was only 99 pages and it focused just on the founding of the Cody right. community. The one down at the American Heritage Center was a little longer, about 120 pages, and it covered sections of Beck's entire life. So we were curious as to what had happened to the, the memoir. The rest of it, yeah. So in Lynn, you can Talk well, about I, reaching out to BJ. Um, there are, at that time, there was a grandson and granddaughter who were still alive of George Beck's. And I had met the granddaughter and her husband in 1996 when um, Cody was celebrating their centennial. And I knew that they had photos and I knew that there were manuscripts. So with that connection, um, I got in touch with B.J. Gerber, the granddaughter, and um, they very nicely drove all the way out here from Virginia with boxes and boxes of manuscripts in various stages and photographs, and it took us a while, with their help, to sort through everything and figure out exactly which manuscript was actually the first one and therefore the truest one to George Beck's words, because we knew that there had been an attempt at some point that the, the daughters had wanted to publish this, and they had reached out to a publishing company, but they'd already heavily edited it. So we yes. wanted to get back to the bare bones, original manuscript of George Beck. So. Okay, and that material is now here in the McCracken Research Library archive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I have to say, that was one of the most exciting Time it was Christmas. Of my life. It was Christmas. <laughs> I still remember going through the was the last of the four boxes, mm -hmm. and we're getting towards the bottom, and big three ring binder, yeah, old old fashioned, yeah, and cloth we, covered. We binder. pulled it out, and it was really it was it was different mm -hmm. compared to the other manuscripts, mm -hmm. and I think there were oh, at least ten more manuscripts yeah, I mean, that were in this good. box, mm -hmm. and some were written as historical novels. But uh, anyway, we pulled this big binder out. We started looking at it. What really tipped us off was the comments, the handwritten comments in the manuscript. 
the editing from the daughters, which really opened our eyes to George Beck. And I still recall when we first, when I first met mm -hmm. George and B.J. Gerber, B.J. told us, he said, you know, my grandfather had this wonderful, puckish sense of humor. And I, I grew up in this area, and I knew about George Beck. I've read about George Beck, and I always assumed he was a pretty stern businessman. And mm -hmm. when you look at photos of him, it looks like this guy has absolutely no sense of humor. Yeah, they never smile. Yeah. But we started going through the memoir, and it was just amazing how a few edits mm -hmm. could really strip away a person's character. Mm -hmm. The one section that really revealed that to me was when he was talking about courting Daisy. She was a school teacher at Marquette, and he said he would go up there in his buckboard, and he would bring a sack full of ginger snaps, and they would drive around the, the basin, and she would eat the ginger snaps that he brought along with them, which was interesting because BJ said he did the same thing with them when they were grandchildren. When they were kids, when he took the grandkids for a Yeah, they would drive around, and he had a bag of ginger snaps, and he'd tell the kids stories, and they'd eat the ginger snaps. But anyway, the daughters got a hold of this, and someone went through and they crossed out buckboard and wrote buggy, which is a whole different connotation. It was really a whole different scene being set. And then one of the daughters recommended omitting all the references to ginger snaps, which was unfortunate because Beck, in the story, concluded, he said, you know, I finally worked up the courage. I asked Daisy to marry me, and she said yes, but I think she was saying yes to more ginger snaps. <laughs> that story was completely gone in the yeah, ones that had been turned over to the Heritage Center and to the Park County Archives. And so there's a wonderful example of this puppy sense yeah. of humor yeah. that had been they really, taken away. They really stripped away his, his, uh, his personality. His personality, yeah. 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 And his wording. I mean, I mean, even sentence structure in many cases got changed. Yes. So it was a really wonderful day when you found mm -hmm. this manuscript. And, it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, began the work on it. And BJ was ecstatic that somebody was going to be, you know, wanted mm -hmm. to publish this because it's been in the family for so long and sort of been dangling over them, you know, this should be done. We want our grandfather's autobiography to be published. But so this it's is languishing. The, yes. so. Mm -hmm. so this is the full account that we've yeah. never had until mm -hmm. now. And how did you divvy up the work on this uh, particular project? <laughs> Organized chaos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think literally we sat down. Well, first we first we got it um, typed, so yes. that it was an, we had an electronic version. Yeah, and Kim Zerline here yeah. at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West transcribed it for us, which mm -hmm. allowed us to get an electronic sit, format. We could hover over, over a computer over and, and, and go through it and, and and read it that way. Yeah. yeah. And so then once we got through it all, then we knew, and we had talked about um, heavily footnoting it because there were all these names in there that were not, you know, household names by any stretch of the imagination. And so basically, um, I think I took the first five chapters, or I think 22 chapters ago, 22 yeah. chapters, or 20 chapters. 20 yeah. chapters. Well, we, we divvied it up since you have some strong connections to the, to the East, East. So, and yeah. you're unfortunately a Yankee fan, <laughs> we uh, we put Lynn in charge of the, the Eastern part, part and I was it, kind yeah. of working on the other and you section, did the Western, the Western part. section. Yeah. And then when it came back to Cody, because that's the, the town of Cody, not Buffalo Bill, but then I, I took over that yeah, part. Yeah. yeah, but I'd say the greatest challenge for us is Beck loved to drop names. I, this was a guy who was very well connected and knew a lot of people. And as I vision how the manuscript came about, he was probably dictating this to someone. Uh, my suspicion is it might have been Daisy, Daisy yeah. or it could have been Margaret Hayden who wrote an article about Beck for the State Historical Society news newsletter. But anyway, he would throw out these names and the person doing the transcribing at that time didn't get the spellings correct. Okay, that would have made it. Or, sort of or asked him. Or, or asked followed him. up with him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, I mean, we have concluded he was a terrible speller. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, and it was a challenge because <laughs> he, 
He was in Cuba. He was back east. Oh, he was he in was California. Dog. He went all, all over, over the place yeah. and start dropping these yeah. names. And so we were trying to figure out who are these people. And we missed a couple. And since the book has come out, we've had a few people contact us and said, this may have been so-and-so. So, so, but, but that was the greatest challenge yeah. is just trying to track trying to down who is this person. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. some of them are really, and that in itself was really quite revealing. And, and sometimes he just mentioned a first name and said, yeah. like, so-and-so the Packer or something like that. Or, yeah. You know, so yeah. They will re forever remain mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's good to mention that this memoir is extensively footnoted. And I just kept a finger in the footnotes as I went <laughs> through, and they're interesting in themselves. Mm -hmm. It's also, uh, there's a foreword by the Simpson brothers here who both, Grew up in Cody and knew the socialized. They called him the governor. Mm -hmm. the governor. Socialized with with the grandkids with DJ and her brother. And then too, the the only the last five chapters are devoted to Cody, which is maybe the better known chapter to many of us. But there are fifteen chapters before we get before we get to so Cody Wyoming. There's a substantial yes. bit of story that you've never heard before, mm -hmm. which I, I just think is quite mm -hmm. quite interesting. So. Um, Let's go ahead and talk about his background, uh, where he was born, and and about his his parents because they seem to have quite an influence on on him. Yeah, well, his his parents, his heritage, which he was quite proud of, you know, he could trace through his mother's side of the family a connection to the Washington family. He was descended from George Washington's brother Lawrence through his mother. And the family was quite proud of their, their Washington connections. His father was a Scottish immigrant who came from Dumfrieshire to the United States. And there was a little bit of an issue because the Washington family didn't want their, their relation to marry an immigrant. And so they had to overcome that, but, uh, but you know, really, Beck came from this this background, this Scottish background, which I think is rare. He really got his love of storytelling and that pucky sense of humor. And then that connection to the Washington family really kind of established him in the, the founding of the country and and just had that background of, of adventure, um, you know, moving forward in the West. And I think he was always interested in, you'll note in here he refers to the money he inherited from some land that Washington had acquired in the American West and then was sold, and he took that money to come out west. I think he was always interested in that that background. And his middle names are Washington. He's George Washington Thornton Beck, so he's they passed that Washington name yes. on down to him. <laughs> so very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the family settled in Lexington, Kentucky, mm -hmm. which was a border state during the Civil War. Right. Right. And pretty interesting, his recollections of his boyhood during the, the Civil War mm -hmm. um, and the privations that even his well-off family faced. Mm -hmm. um, the, the town was besieged, the, it was shelled, and the, they had to go down into the basement mm -hmm. uh, of the house mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. stay, stay safe. Uh, and uh, he tells quite a few stories uh, about that time in his life. Well, and then they left. I mean, they decided that the better to, to be safe, they needed to go north because they were Union sympathizers, not Confederate sympathizers. Yeah. And they wound up in, in the Philadelphia area and wrote out the war there, as they say. Yeah, and I do think that experience really shaped the way he handled people later on. I think watching his father negotiate through these issues of sectionalism and, and then the conflict of the Civil War and seeing all these different factions that had developed in border states and north versus south. And, yeah, I think Beck really admired his father for being able to come to some compromise and work with these different factions to try and bring them to the same table and, and move forward. So I. Really, you could tell he really admired his father quite a bit. In fact, that was one of the challenges too. We we noticed for some reason the mother would creep in occasionally in the story, but it was more through the daughter's annotations on the side. And his there. father was a senator. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about 
George Beck as a young man and the character traits that come out in these accounts of his childhood and young manhood. Um, the family had moved to Philadelphia um, for safety towards the latter part of the Civil War. Right. And we hear quite a bit about his, his time there and after that. So can you talk a little bit about that period? Well, he was obviously a, a stubborn child. Strong-willed. Strong-willed, <laughs> very independent. And I, I think being the only boy in the family, you know, he got away with quite a, quite a bit of misbehavior at times. So one of my favorite stories of his child is when he was getting into his mother's medicine collection with his pet monkey and they were sitting there and they went through and they devoured all of this medicine and the mother came home and found, you know, everything had been devoured. Mm -hmm. And so Beck received a spanking with the carpet, carpet slipper, slipper. <laughs> the carpet, carpet slipper. And then uh, the other one I liked was when he was looking out the window and saw a kid that had shorter hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'll cut my own hair. <laughs> <laughs> he threw a little hissy fit. Yes. He yeah. Had nice hair. Yeah, he yeah. did. And I, yeah. boys were dressed as girls sometimes yeah. back then. So. But now there's it's clear that there was a, a tension there between his mother and and him, and he was a pretty strong-willed child and liked to do things on his own. But uh, like uh, adventures, even like, at that age. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, it's it's um, again kind of amazing those those stories just to see what childhood was like back in that exactly. day and age. Mm -hmm. A lot of hunting. Went off to rode his horse out past somebody's farm. I can't remember the person. And um, he thought he was off on his own and and. But it turned out that the, the homeowner was keeping an eye on him and could report back to his parents that, yeah. oh yeah, he's, he's, he's safe or whatever, you know. Yeah, no, he definitely had a love of yeah. adventure beginning at a very early age and liked to strike out on his own. And, and I, he was a very strong athletic oh, young yes. man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was a big man, mm -hmm. but he was also an athlete. Yes, he athlete. rode crew in college, um, he wrestled. Um, he took boxing lessons from Billy in Baltimore or someplace. Yeah, there. he was in the, the boxing scene for quite a while. Right, and right. Um, he, would, he would get in the ring and he would mm -hmm. spar back and forth mm -hmm. with these, these boxers that were, were big names at right, that point in right. time. So he was um, interested in West Point. <laughs> but that didn't work out. Can you talk about that a minute? Well, his... His father was a senator and therefore could appoint, I don't know if they could have, if he could only appoint one to each of the two academies at that time. There was only the Naval, in fact, I don't even know if the Naval Academy had started yet. Um, but anyway, he could appoint to West Point and, and practically at the last minute, his father decided to appoint the son of a good friend of his who I believe was the, his secretary or... Anyway, this young man, his father felt that this young man needed a, a little step up in life. And, um, but Jeremy has a, yeah. a shadow theory here. <laughs> it, it's not stated in Beck's memoir, but I have a sneaking suspicion that maybe his father did not want Beck to go into the military. Uh, there are certain sections in the memoir where you could tell the parents were very protective mm -hmm. of Beck. And so I'm wondering if the father thought, you know, after what we've witnessed during the Civil War, don't know if I really want my son mm -hmm. to be in, in a military outfit. And so I'm and, wondering if maybe he and the, came up with that story. And the Native American point. situation was still yeah. ongoing. I mean, you yeah. know, they, they build a well, fort at West and, it, and, and yeah, yeah, and it would, you know, be attacked. And That's very be, interesting. Yeah. So he attended Rensselaer Polytechnic. Institution, mm -hmm. studied engineering, mm -hmm. but he didn't finish because he inherited some money mm -hmm. through his mother's family in connection again to Washington. And that was what launched his Go career Western, right? as a Westerner. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, no, and it is interesting to, to contemplate you know, 
here in Cody, Wyoming, our connections to, to George Washington. And it's been suggested, BJ suggested this, that basically it was Washington who started the town of Cody <laughs> through these, these lands he had acquired that were then disposed of, and, and that's where Beck acquired his fortune that sent him west, and he could have very well likely invested some of that money into the into the founding of the town of Cody. So, and it, you know, and he was always really good in touting his connections to George Washington while he was here in the community. He did have Washington's seal, wax seal, the ring seal, where they would seal the back of the envelopes, and he would, every Washington birthday would go into the local schools, and kids would melt wax, and they'd use the, the imprint ring and get their own wax seals bring home something that, you know, really a hands-on connection to George Washington. Well, he turned 21 in 1877. That's a year after the Custer battle to set the scene. And that was the year he headed west and he, and he gathered up some of his friends, which was also pretty typical of him. Yeah. Um, you could say some of his, kind of his college people. friends from Rensselaer. Yes. And they... Um, joined him and they tried their hand at prospect. Um, the bug had bitten him then and he never really got over it, no. he admitted. Right. Pros prospecting was fascinating to George Beck. But they, they traveled to Denver and put their backpack together and headed for Leadville, Colorado. Yeah, yeah, no, um, definitely I think that independent spirit led him out to the West mm -hmm. and I believe he he thought he could strike it rich in Leadville and, and you know, declare even more independence from his family. And you mentioned his age. He was definitely 21 and bulletproof. <laughs> and he and his buddies got into so much trouble out here. And it's really, it's amazing. He, may, he jests about some of his adventures and makes light of them. But there were some situations where he was... In life-threatening situations, you know, and he was ducking and dodging a forest fire. Yeah, I got he, caught in the middle of a forest fire by a mountain lion. Right. Right. Uh, and he was mistaken for a stagecoach robber. Robber. <laughs> it, there are lots of really fun stories yeah. about that period. Yeah, yeah, no, he really had quite an adventure in Colorado, and you know, one of my favorite. He always was good at making light of his situation yeah, and, and his inexperience in the West and. And he talks about wearing his buckskin pants and they get wet and the buckskin stretches and stretches and so he's walking on the back of his pants and he decides to trim them up a little and and the, continues to get them, you know, stretch out in the back there, trims them up and then when the pants dry, yeah, they no longer fit. Yeah, yeah, they're more like shorts, so. He still had a little bit to learn. <laughs> but he comes back to Denver in some of his attire, and the clerk at a fancy hotel where he had stayed on the way out wouldn't refused him a room. Exactly. <laughs> so he said, well, I stayed here on my way out. <laughs> you know, he used to smell to high heavens, too. Yeah, it? which is amazing. That's one thing I really have to admire about George Beck, because, and I think he, you know, when he goes out west, it really reveals how well he did get along with almost anybody mm -hmm. he would meet. Mm -hmm. uh, here he is in Leadville with all these rough miners. He meets a guy who a few years later is involved in a horrendous murder case and gets along with them. In fact, his mother's collection of medicines proved to be useful mm -hmm. when he's treating various elements there in the mining camps. And But when Yolk know, comes in and just assumes it's no big deal to walk into a fancy hotel mm -hmm. and you know, give me a room. Give me a room. <laughs> <laughs> so it very well connected with all these different people, and it didn't matter if it was back east or if it was out in the American West. He got along with almost he everybody. He described yeah. himself as yes. plain George Beck. That's yeah. really right. I think what he was. That's yeah. exactly. he and that's what he wanted to be. Character at all. No, that was one reason why he didn't stay in the east too. Oh, I think it was yeah. one of the underlying reasons. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to be Senator Beck's son, or I think that's you know, right. Just but Senator Beck pulled him out of Colorado. <laughs> you have to explain why that Colorado adventure ended. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was, a, there was a little bit of an Indian battle going on <laughs> in the Colorado area, and Mom and Dad were in, in Minneapolis, 
and they were concerned about him, and so they said, yeah. "Come see us." And but sort of put it under the guise of, you know, your mother's got some health problems. He really went thinking that maybe this would be the last time that he would see her. And of course, he got there, and yeah. that wasn't the case at all. Yeah, no, and it was, you know, the Meager massacre, the Ute War in Colorado was okay. big news. Mm -hmm. And I, I know the Pam, the parents again being overprotective and knowing how independent and adventurous their son was, mm -hmm. thought we need to get him out of Colorado mm -hmm. or he'll get in the middle of this Indian War. Mm -hmm. And you could tell he was, he was pretty frustrated. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, they had cost him his chance to strike it big in, mm -hmm. in Colorado. However, it again led to a right. yet another adventure for Beck. For Beck. So uh, he decided, well, start working on the, the railroad, the Northern Pacific Railroad, which was then building mm -hmm. across the Dakota Territory. And, and using his education. Yeah, yeah, so he it's used that surveying background. Right, so there is an, edu is an engineer school, mm -hmm. engineering school. And he actually, he went through the, the Badlands, through Medora, mm -hmm. you know, just right before people like Theodore Roosevelt and mm -hmm. Marquis de Moray were coming through there. So he was going through there with the railroad into Montana. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, Beck had this knack for landing in the perfect place at the perfect time because it's working on the railroad. He meets Miles, General Jim, Miles, Jim Miles. Um, who was a... Colonel he was a colonel at the time. time, and so anyway, and it's actually Miles that tells him about all this wonderful land that's available in present-day Northwest Wyoming. Northeast. The, the, nor, northeast, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> northeast, the Powder River country, country. and yeah. said so that would be a good place to settle, and Beck goes down there and becomes one of the first mm -hmm. homesteaders in that area. So let's pick up the memoir when he's finishing up with the railroad. Yeah, you, you could tell he was not too happy with the railroad job. Um, you know, he obviously had some issues with one of his supervisors who he claimed had stole a map he had put together of that region. And so he and his friends set off on yet another adventure, and once again, he almost gets himself killed. They come across a skirmish, which we believe, looking at some of the other resources, a band of of some of Sitting Bull's Lakota had come down on some mm -hmm. raiding expeditions and, and basically back in his campaigns come across this aftermath of this intertribal conflict that had taken place where a few Indians were killed. And it's there when he meets Miles, gets the idea of going down to the Sheridan area. And it's also interesting as they're heading down towards the Powder River country, you had a section of the group that wanted to go out and become buffalo hunters. They saw this as a way to make some, some money. And Beck and another companion decided, no, we want to do something a little more substantial. And that's when he located his, his spot. Uh, he built a, a cabin there and started growing a garden. And then from there, again, using all those connections, he really was trying to diversify what he was producing in the area. You know, started a flour mill, was growing grain, and what did the he... Goose, Goose Creek area. The Goose Creek area, a present day Becton. South, yeah, yeah, present day Becton and, and a little south east of, of Sheridan. Mm -hmm. Sheridan, yeah. is that right? Yeah. It wasn't ever clear yeah. exactly where. Yeah, and then, you know, and then was. of course, he's in the middle of ranching country, and he decides, well, sheep look profitable. I think we'll bring <laughs> sheep in. And he was a little shocked that the... Cattle ranchers in that day and age, Morton Fruin and his men said, yeah, we really don't want these range maggots coming in and taking over the, the range. And so, you know, he, but again, I think it just really demonstrates this guy was looking to diversify. And could get along with problem. everybody because oh, yeah, yeah. Bringing, bringing the sheep back and about to cross the creek, um, they let him pass. Mm -hmm. They were armed armed guards there, and but... For the ranchers, but they let her pass. So. He has, he has some very vivid memories of the Johnson County War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. Frank Canton, who was one of the key players of the Johnson mm -hmm. County War, his wife, Frank Canton's wife, was one of the, the housekeepers for Beck. So he was pretty well connected to not only the invaders, the Johnson County invaders mm -hmm. that were brought up by people like Nate Champion, I'm sorry, uh, Frank Canton, 
but he also knew a lot of the other, the so-called rustling Rustlers, element yes, there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, definitely he was right in the middle of those two different that. factions. But mostly he focused on his various enterprises. Mm -hmm. And you just get a picture of the man's energy and you know his willingness to try what worked. Right, right. Um, yeah. And then too, you know, he, he didn't always succeed, but he seemed to laugh off his his failures. Semi failures, I mean, yeah. yeah. And make a joke yeah. of them and just kind of move on. Mm -hmm. I, I'm gonna read a passage that I think is fun because it kind of gives you an idea of the style of the memoir. Um, and uh, he's going to talk to you about his, his gardening. He said, the gardening phase worked out a lot better probably because I recalled the trials of my first garden. When I had built the cabin, I had spaded up a half acre for potatoes. Then I rode down to Fort McKinney and bought a sack full of them. These I carefully cut so as to have two eyes in each piece and with the greatest pains I laid out nice rows and planted them. The next morning I went out to look at my crop. They were all up. The most remarkable potatoes I had ever known. My friends the cinnamon bears had visited me during the night and left not a single piece of spud in the ground. Those bears and I were no longer friends. I declared war and some of their hides soon decorated my cabin. Then I turned that garden into a sheep corral, which later quite paid agreeable dividends. The strawberries grown there were larger than my thumb, while the rhubarb leaves were as big as tabletops. So see, the sheep paid off. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> More ways than one. More ways than one. <laughs> but he was an outdoorsman. He loved his hunting yeah. and went out uh, uh, up into the Bighorn Mountains. He prospected up prospected there. Prospected up there, yeah. And it was those prospecting trips and glimpsing the west from there mm -hmm. that he mm -hmm. saw the Bighorn Basin and became kind yeah. of intrigued with what was got up on top of what he was mountain. seeing over mm -hmm. there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no, and you know we look at it. He probably would have done quite well if he stayed in Sheridan. Mm -hmm. And once again, he was pretty good at at interacting with the residents there. Um, had built a pretty good life for himself. Yeah, he ran for office. Ran for office. As, as he was Democrat, elected yeah. from. Uh, from Sheridan County Sheridan, yeah. to serve in the territorial legislature, and he was there when Wyoming shifted from being a territory to a state. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's one of the missing treasures of the Beck family. Mm -hmm. Beck was presented a gavel for chairing the legislature that moved from Through territory yeah. to oh, statehood, nice. and it's, it's, it's missing. missing. And the Beck yeah. family is really trying to find out where that may have ended yeah. up. We've, we've searched. We've looked up here in Cody, and it doesn't seem to have ended up in any of the local repositories. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and the other thing, too, is he got along very well with the, the American Indians in that area. They would frequently stop by. And, and if you're interested, for anyone that really likes the cooking aspects, um, Beck provides a wonderful recipe for omelets that he would serve <laughs> any uninvited guests yes. that showed up. It was an easy meal that he'd throw together and, and the recipes in the back of the book. He, so. he was interested in, in food and yeah. in cooking and he apparently Well, I think when you had, you had to plan ahead. I mean, yes. yeah. you know, you couldn't go to the store and you didn't have a refrigerator and, you know, mm -hmm. things were a heck of a lot different. So. And that's another thing about this book that I think really is, you know, sets it aside from other homesteading memoirs, is Beck really demonstrates that, you know, these homesteaders weren't out in the middle of nowhere, completely isolated and, and never went anywhere. They were just sitting there constantly watching after their, their interest. I mean, Beck continued to travel all over when he was in Sheridan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. maintain a lot of these connections and I mean it's through these connections he starts building up a pack of hunting greyhounds mm -hmm. that he used quite a bit um, sent his wheat that he grew in Sheridan or in the Beckton area to the Columbian Exposition and then won an award yeah. and so yeah these these people were not that isolated right. they still right. were fairly well connected to the rest of the United States and Beck's memoir really demonstrates right. how really connected they right. were yeah. Yeah. yeah I think well it helps that there was more transportation than 
either a horse or a stagecoach. I mean, yeah, the railroads. The railroad yeah. made travel a little bit easier. And you did have a few rough stagecoach yes. rides and, mm -hmm. and then a few other adventures mm -hmm. riding in the countryside. He claimed he met the James Brothers, the yes. outlaw gang, mm -hmm. the James Brothers, who a lot of people in the Sheridan area will tell you that the James would use that as a, the James gang would use it as a hideout. Mm -hmm. And a neighboring cabin. Yeah. <laughs> and one Beck ended up spending the night yes. with Jesse and Frank James and their outlaw band. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you will sleep here and one <laughs> and one and one leaned up against the door so that Beck couldn't leave. I mean you know. Yeah. Yeah, there was one outlaw that slept with his back on the door and yeah. had a pistol yeah. in his hand. Which was interesting because Beck's own son ended up fighting overseas and um, they were in a he and his unit were in a, a house somewhere and they needed some rest so remembering his father's oh, stories he <laughs> slept with his back on the door with his firearm and nearby. And went over his uh, his crew there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that impressed them. That impressed them. Yes. Yes. No there's one, one escapade after another and, yeah. and yeah. really a colorful time in Sheridan mm -hmm. and a, Made me wonder why he left, but uh, we can we can certainly speculate. We can't mm -hmm. really say for sure, except that he learned uh, from someone who had been over the ground here that there was a, a great water source in what was then known as the Stinking Water Stinking River. Water River yeah. and that would be Laban Hillberry, who was a an old time. Sort of prospector, not quite mountain man, but walked all over the Bighorn Basin and actually was his came from the Thermopolis area and met George Beck and on top of Bald Mountain one day when Beck was up there and yeah. said, you know, I think there's a great area that because Yellowstone had been founded in 1872, so now we're talking about the time period of about 1893, 1894, right. and so. Um, Yellowstone was a going concern as far as the tourism industry was concerned. And the Bighorn Basin, there, were, there was settlement in the area of Tensleep. People had mm -hmm. come up right. over Cottonwood Pass. Right. That area where people were starting ranching mm -hmm. there. Right. There had been some ranching development mm -hmm. in the basin. Um, well, this was Crow Treaty land. Yes. So it was the, la it's the last area settled, um, or uh, let me rephrase that, uh, opened for settlement. Um, in the lower 48 states, so and so to as white a frontier. Yeah, yeah. yes, and whites could so not come in settled. here. And quite a while. settlement was a late phenomenon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this yeah. particular part of the basin mm -hmm. wasn't well known. Right? Yeah, right. yeah, no, and you know, we often joke here in the Bighorn Basin that you know when these first homesteaders were coming in and decided they want to grow crops, you know, they basically said, you know, it'd be a a wonderful place it just needs water and good people and then all the waves would say yeah that's all hell needs <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, you think about what lures these people to places like the Bighorn Basin because you know, at the time it's the stinking water river mm -hmm. it's right flowing right through what was identified as Coulter's hell there's no water it's very dry it's, it's arid dead. high plains yeah, no trees it, yeah. And you think, what, on anybody for what would motivate somebody to come out here with this crazy notion you could bring water to the land and grow all sorts of crops? I mean, it was, uh, you, you think about that in the 1890s. Today, we don't think much of it, but in the 1890s, looking mm -hmm. at the treeless era at Bighorn Basin and thinking, how in the world anybody would think they could pull this yeah. off? Mm -hmm. But Beck, being an engineer, a practical mm -hmm. thinker, a problem mm -hmm. solver, exactly. got interested in how you would do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. And he came over and surveyed what would become the Cody Canal. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, and again, I think Beck, his, his willingness to collaborate with people and getting with the experts, there were a lot of people who really contributed to the building of the town of mm -hmm. Cody. You know, he, Laban Hillberry provided him the information, but he brought in yeah. Elwood Mead, the state engineer. Yeah, he brought in really, Buffalo Bill for, I mean, you know, yeah. for the financial. Yeah, no, and he had the financial backing. But, you know, and Cody, in Buffalo Bill, back realized this is a guy that could sell this. 
Uh, this is a guy who is an international celebrity. He's traveling all over the United States. He's traveling over to Europe. Through the Wild West, this individual could basically promote the Bighorn Basin and also make connections with you know, the group down in mm -hmm. Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. that uh, invested money into this project. So Rumsey, Bleistein, Garens, who all get streets named after them here in, in Cody, Wyoming. But I mean, Cody and Beck, they really, they kind of had certain roles here and they fulfilled them to the fullest and made it work. And Cody was invested in Sheridan himself. Um, and Beck was friends with the son in law. Son -in -law Port 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 Port. Um, so he made that connection and got Cody pretty mm -hmm. fascinated uh, because Cody had some ideas about developing Sheridan mm -hmm. and then changed his mind. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, no, and some of the newspaper accounts state Buffalo Bill was interested in a stage line from Sheridan to Yellowstone, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of a, which is a long idea. jumping, yeah, <laughs> point, yes. a long ways away. Shadowing the Eden Brothers. Right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, I think so. But I mean, there was descriptions in one of the newspaper articles that they were going to have cowboys all duded up wow. that would drive these it's tourists just, across the west to Yellowstone. Up the shade stagecoach at one point to give them a thrill. Lots right. of ideas were flowing. Lots obviously. of ideas, lots of ideas. And Fortunately, some of them didn't take <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you know, again, I think that teamwork, it really proved off yeah. because yeah. Elwood Mead was very practical. He told them right off the bat, you guys cannot irrigate as much land as you think you can irrigate, right. you need to scale this project back, which was really insightful because even at the smaller project, it was they ran out of money. Yeah. They ran out of money and they had lots of trouble with yeah. the subsoil and yeah. some things that they didn't expect. Prairie dogs out. were yeah. burrowing holes in the ditch and you know, and they ran out of money even with all of Buffalo Bill's resources, mm -hmm. Beck's resources, the investors from Buffalo and Sheridan, Wyoming. And again, those connections paid off because Beck, his father had served in the U.S. Senate with George Hurst, mm -hmm. the father of William Randolph Hurst. And Beck realized that P.B. Hurst was very philanthropic mm -hmm. and when, was a family friend. And so he went out and he asked her to buy up all the water bonds. B.B. Hurst's financial advisor almost had a heart attack <laughs> when he finds out she's investing in, in, this, in Wyoming, mm -hmm. this wonderful project in Coulter's Hill on the stinking water river. And he said, I can't, don't give him this money. And she said, no, give him, give him the money. And lo and behold, she bailed the whole thing out and moved yeah. it forward. But, you know, this was by no means a secure project. No, and no. it really got through by the skin of its teeth. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. And... Well, Going through this memoir, I think the biggest issue to regret this town should have is we've named streets after Bleistein, Rumsey, Garens, all these guys who donated. Jeremy's Crusade. <laughs> nothing here in this town honoring Phoebe Hurst. Yeah. So there's nothing in this town honoring her, and she's really she. If it wasn't for her, we wouldn't be here today. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Well. Um, Beck was kind of the guy on the ground, though, making it happen, yeah. wasn't he? I mm -hmm. mean, he was the on-site manager. manager yeah. of these, these mm -hmm. work crews who, yeah. who had to keep them on He was the day-to-day -day manager of it and, and, uh, and yeah. he seemed oversaw to everything. He was genius yeah. for this mm -hmm. kind of work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, who, uh, it seems as though what he'd been doing all his life kind of fitted him for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All culminated in the town of Yeah, no, that's yeah. very true. He just kind of found his spot here, and eventually he sold out his, his interests in Sheridan, sold the ran the Becton ranch off mm -hmm. to the Forbes family, and made Cody mm -hmm. his home. Mm -hmm. We've speculated as to why he cut those ties to Sheridan, but I, yeah, I somewhat suspect maybe he just seeing the fallout from the Johnson County War and that mm -hmm. tension there. Decided maybe it's a good chance, a good time to get good time out of here. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, again, and he once he gets here, they get the Cody Canal established. Mm -hmm. Both Beck and Cody were very good in saying we need to diversify the economy, right. and they're investing in mining, mm -hmm. drilling, back the electric plants, electric plants. And, and, yeah. mm -hmm. and then they think the federal government through the reclamation service will also develop all the farmland between present-day Powell and Cody 
which took quite a while. And, and then, get that and then they get the and then the dam. I mean, it was yeah, the, the dam. And Buffalo Bill ran out of money and couldn't and couldn't build the dam, so the government yeah. took over. Yeah. So they, they again, they just kind of stuck to it and invested in very things. And Cody finally did get a stage route to Yellowstone, mm -hmm. a little closer. Yeah. Cody did the east entrance, and then and lo and behold, you know, um, Buffalo Bill just in some ways eclipsed Beck's practical day-to-day -day role in developing the Bighorn Basin by promoting it so well. Yeah, he sure did. Yeah. In the newspaper articles and in Last of the Great Scouts written by Buffalo Bill Co uh, Buffalo Bill's sister, sister, Ellen Cody Whitmore, he betrays himself as this Moses-like figure <laughs> where he's on top of the Bighorn's mountains and he has an eye infection and his guide gets this magical water from a spring somewhere and bathes Cody's eyes and Cody looks out and sees the Bighorn Basin and decides this is this is it. This is the land. It's not quite the, the visionary definition I had of Buffalo Bill. <laughs> He's a visionary but that not... catches on yeah. and he gets the credit. Mm -hmm. That really belongs yeah. to him. It really belongs to but yeah, uh, I, I look back and I see those early photos of Cody. I think what in the world would entice my ancestors who came out here in the late eighteen nineties what were they thinking coming out here? And I know they probably somewhere in Buffalo Bill yeah. pitched to them he, that well, he, uh, yeah. this was the place and they bought into it and they he, started coming out. He here. had advertisements in his programs. He rode on the covered wagons that were in the show, you know, Bighorn Basin or Bust. And I'm sure that he talked it up every chance he oh, could yeah. get, you know, one on one or, you know, at a bar scene or something like yeah. that. When there wasn't an outlet for national news, he was as national mm -hmm. as you got yeah. in those days. Right. And then he proceeded to try and establish the town site mm -hmm. because of the proximity to the hot springs on the river, I remember. He, right. Yeah, the he first thought that was site. going to be the attraction mm -hmm. to that area, so mm -hmm. he laid out an initial town site, which then back Both up. sides of the river, yeah. named after, with many of the streets named after Civil War generals, but, well, Demer Charles Demaris had been squatting on that land out there, but then he went and filed on it, and he wasn't going to sell. And so then, and then they realized it would be hard for the railroad to get all the way out to that site, yeah, so, so then they um, re -established re -established and reestablished and okay, beckoned and Aiden surveyed. Created downtown Cody. Yeah, and you have to wonder what was going through Cody's mind because you would have had the town basically separated by the, the river and that deep, deep, no, not necessarily the canyon, but it's but still it's, a pretty good. Look at go, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I'm it's, thinking, what were they envisioning? A, a bridge going across yeah. that? And if yeah. you, I guess if it did come to fruition, you know, no one that lived in the that town would have been afraid of heights. That's right. They wanted to get yeah. across town. I mean, I think, you know, Throw the shark stronger over on the north side yeah. of the river. And that's an interesting. Beck, you know, it's it's often been theorized that Beck and Cody were just constantly butting butting heads. And there were some issues where they were fighting, and the town of Cody was one. Beck said Cody's town isn't going to work out there. So he plotted his own town, right. and they were going to name it you know, Shoshone, Shoshone and yeah. Fairfield. They yeah. had different names. And Buffalo Bill found out, well, my town's not going to work. Theirs will probably work. I want it named after me. So he pulled some strings and was able to get the town named Cody. Yeah. Beck could have thrown a fit, and he just basically said, you know. That's, that's what the colonel wants. Yeah. That's what the colonel wants, and it's going to be good. It's, it's a name that and people will recognize. Another, they couldn't have another Shoshone. So but he just basically it. said, you know, that's fine with me, and let it go. So. <laughs> Yeah, his ego didn't need to be stroked as True. much as other people's. <laughs> they seem to have a pretty affable relationship mm -hmm. for the most part. It's a little bit hard to tell. Yeah. Um, there are some stories where Beck gets the best of Cody who plays on oh. some practical jokes, several practical yeah. jokes on Cody. Well, and Cody was traveling so much that a lot of it is all through correspondence. Mm -hmm. And so some of it you do have to read between the lines. And what might have been a joke from one to the other can be misinterpreted. Yeah, there's a wonderful letter where he, Cody's telling him to get out of the bars and stop chasing that woman up in Marquette. She's too young for you. Yeah, yeah. And you can read that as, boy, Cody's really laying in the back. And I and I always would have thought that until we came across the, the manuscript, because there's a section in there where 
Beck describes this trip with Cody through the Bighorn Basin, and they're visiting all these ranchers, and they stop in the Mormon community of Burlington. And, and it's like a, a road trip with two frat brothers. <laughs> uh, these guys are getting into all sorts of trouble. You know, uh, Beck's playing all these practical jokes on Buffalo Bill at this dance, and and uh, and I find out actually um, through Bill Hayes, one of your volunteers here, that it was his ancestors that stole the whiskey out of the wagon, <laughs> and Buffalo Bill and Beck blamed the Mormons, the older Mormons, that, and they had, Beck notes in his memoir that they could get one Mormon at a time to come out and drink the whiskey. The next it was morning terrible. it's gone. It was yeah, terrible yeah. whiskey. Next yeah. morning it's gone, and so, but it, it just, you could tell they really got along well yeah. together when they were with each other, and I think a lot of those letters, he, he, it's easy to misread the tone. But, you know, and then it was tense, it was yeah. tense. But one of my favorite Beck stories is when they were on this trip, and they were in a wagon, and they're going through, and a uh, herd of antelope run by, and Buffalo Bill jumps out, and he takes the rifle, and he fires at this herd of antelope, and he misses every one of them. And he comes back to the wagon, and Buffalo Bill tells Beck, he says, damn it, Beck, you tell anybody about this, I'm going to kill you. And Beck says, well, based on what I just saw, I don't think I have too much to worry about. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the so, best And then you mentioned the potatoes. He did mention that one of the Beck's gardens, that Cody was a pretty good shot, and Beck was throwing these small potatoes up in the air, and Cody was hitting them with the rifle. I thought he was a pretty darn good one. Well, Beck then proceeds to hit a lot of the highlights of Cody history mm -hmm. that those of us who lived here recognize you know, right, the, the, right. some of the famous events mm -hmm. in, of the town, the, the bank robbery, the, and the visit of the Prince of Monaco, yeah, right, and, right. And, and a number of those stories that are somewhat more familiar to yeah. us, but uh, uh, Frederick Remington's story is a pretty colorful one that uh, you don't want to miss, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I don't know if we want to take time to touch on any no, of those, we're we're just kind of a little up and thirsting for more. Just <laughs> as a teaser, let's say that Remington really liked to eat trout. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You learned that. He liked to eat trout, and that got the better of him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, uh, I think we've we've covered it pretty well, uh, and uh, I I encourage everyone who's taken an interest in our stories today to find this book and. Uh, give George Beck a, a chance to tell a story the way it should be told. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, remember that this is, the book is Beckoning Frontiers, a memoir of a Wyoming entrepreneur. So with that, I want to thank Jeremy and Lynn for taking the time to discuss this today. And uh, thank you very much. You're thank you, welcome. Mary. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks to you and your staff you know, for working with us. The Beck Collection is now here at the McCracken Research Library, and it can be researched, and anyone who wants to read the original manuscript, it is, it is here now and available.